distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'll introduce myself first. My name is uh, Vlad Kopakovo. I'm chairperson of the Association of Friends of Great Britain, and this is our community centre here in Holland Park. I welcome you all here. Just a, just a quick announcement. At the end, we do have a bar in the kitchen, so you can come pick if you want a drink, and we welcome to your facilities here. So, Max, you know all about, uh, is it John? Oh, Paul, sorry, Paul as well. Much welcome here as well. Interested to hear what Max has to say this evening, various uh, topics to discuss. I'm sure we'll be more, more than welcome to what he has to say. I'm sure after his talk, brief talk, there will be a Q&A session as well. More than welcome also to answer questions as well. Just to say that uh, the talk will be in English, so hopefully everybody understands English here. If they don't, after the talk, you can ask Max questions in Ukrainian as well. Okay, please, Max. Well, well thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to quickly mention that go through that door and the toilets are there, and that's where the fire escape is as well. Okay. Um, I just wanted to briefly say that the reason that I just happened to see that Maxim was coming to the UK on social media, and because of what Boris Johnson had said in uh, the referendum campaign about Ukraine, which was just awful, uh, which made me very angry, and I tweeted like mad about it. Uh, as soon as I saw that Maxim was coming, I felt it was an uh, opportunity that should not be missed, basically. And that was really because there wasn't people out of Ukraine uh, speaking about what was going on in our referendum campaign. And obviously we just had the Dutch referendum where similarly awful things were said about Ukraine. And um, so that was the reason that I did this. Uh, I just briefly say that uh, I first came across Maxine around when the Maidan was happening, when the Revolution of Dignity was happening, and he was making these short films with this German hippie sort of hipster guy going around Ukraine in that purple jacket, which I remember he used to wear all the time. And I thought, well, obviously now gay dolls are coming up like crazy. But also, um, I thought this is a real talent. And so it's just been a delight for me to see the from what I saw two and a half years ago, the maxim that there is now, doing these amazing things on the media and uh, representing Ukraine so well abroad as well. So, maxim. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining and coming. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to see you here. Um, well, I'm just, I'm quickly going to say why, what I'm doing here and uh, what's my agenda. And uh, also, I would love to start, I guess, uh, like to, to devote like a minimum time of me talking and maximum time of me answering any of your questions. I think it's going to be uh, very honest and you know, productive. Uh, I'm here first and foremost to answer questions rather than talking. So I'm here for uh, on a on a trip uh, uh, sponsored by Foreign Office. It's a, a international leaders program. So they take uh, they nominate people from different countries and they come here for some time and they spend uh, time networking, uh, gathering contacts, you know, in any way they uh, find useful for them. So I'm here in uh, two capacities, I guess, uh, like. It has been usually in recent uh, <coughs> months. So I'm here as a media person, as a journalist with journalist background to offer any uh, background information or analysis of what is happening in Ukraine to anyone who's interested, whether it's uh, uh, consultancy groups or, or media people. So we have like uh, uh, maybe said the Guardian and the Economist and you know, anyone who's really kind of into covering Ukraine. And the, the, my concern was that the media coverage and Western media coverage is uh, is a bit off on Ukraine, considering that there is a, a, a narrative coverage of specific issues and you know, some cliches that travel from one piece to another, and sometimes the point of distorting the reality on the ground. So uh, that's why I'm here um, while I was traveling in 
he's in, and I was sitting in an airplane and I was finishing two op-ed pieces. One is in uh, Ukrainian reforms and what is wrong with the media, uh, Western media covering Ukrainian reforms. It's good. I think, I, I hope it's going to be up uh, and published next, early next week. And the an another piece is on um, the rise of uh, Nadia Savchenko. It's going to be published next week at Political Year. Uh, but I, I wasn't comfortable <laughs> speculating on her personally because she's absolutely a new person. We don't know what's going to happen with her as a politician, whether she's going to be uh, the leader, one of the leaders, or she will politically speaking, disappear. So I, I wrote mostly about the, what the, her rise, her meteoric rise, says about the obsession in Eastern, uh, in Eastern Europe with politics of personalities rather than politics of ideologies and uh, uh, where people don't vote for uh, policies, but they vote for personalities and you know, why it's kind of a dangerous tendency and we have to uh, make sure that, it's, uh, that, 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 that it is reversed. So, um, and obviously the point that uh, is also important for me, not as a journalist, and I'm trying to differentiate those things clearly, is uh, my involvement in LGBT advocacy uh, with the civil rights battles in, uh, in Eastern Europe in general, not only Ukraine, but because countries are so similar and they are absolutely different. I have different background when it comes to civil rights equality, they face absolutely uh, similar problems, and not only with Eastern uh, Europe, but with um, uh, with developing countries elsewhere. So uh, for me, it's kind of it's always a learning uh, trip uh, when I meet other people who are involved in civil rights equality. Uh, doesn't have to be, and you know, I do not kind of set it just to uh, specifically LGBT because I, I see it as very kind of complex issue of just general constitutional equality. Uh, so I meet different activists, whether it's a group, you know, with a group that fight for equality uh, with the ethnic minorities, women, and others, just to share um, experiences because it's very helpful uh, to learn from mistakes. So I'm here, I can answer, I'm really glad to answer your questions if you have any. Um, and uh, I think it's gonna be the best to start. So if you, for starting, you have any questions about me specifically, if you are not kind of aware of what I, you know, what my background, what I do, <laughs> please ask them first. So, you know, everyone is on the same page and then we can uh, get rid of this, of, of my um, personal um, background and then start talking about issues. Thank you so much. Um, I think asking uh, when uh, the remarks were made by Boris Johnson about Ukraine at the beginning of May, one of the things that I noticed was that there was no response at all from any Ukrainian pol politicians and that there seemed to be any mention of it at all in the Ukrainian media, so why do you think that was? Uh, well, first and foremost, it's, uh, it's a it's usual thing that in the Ukrainian politicians and especially Ukrainian media, they're mostly preoccupied with the local matters. It's very hard for them to take a, a broader picture and just to link things that are happening in, uh, in other countries. So obviously people follow American elections, they're obviously people uh, aware of the you know, um, Brexit uh, uh, story. But at the same time, they don't care about it as much. And uh, when it comes to remarks of uh, foreign politicians uh, regarding Ukraine, people are kind of used to uh, uh, character assassinations coming from different pol politicians. So then I don't think that nobody kind of feels an urge to respond anymore. Um, but I kind of, yeah, I, I, I did disappointed that we're not even having a general discussion about because Ukraine is marching towards Europe, whether Europe wants it or not. And Ukraine, when you look at all the polls from the last decade, is a generational shift and choice. It's not something that will disappear anytime soon. And that's why I think 
case that it's very tragic that in Ukraine, it's like Ukraine there, not uh, kind of uh, are so on the same page with what is happening uh, inside Europe. So all those debates that are happening between your skeptics and others um, are not part of everyday live conversation inside uh, Ukraine. And that's something that needs to be changed just because everyone should be on the same page if they want to, you know, to be integrated and live together and be a major player. And I'm honestly, I honestly believe whether with the European Union integration and with Ukraine is already uh, playing an important role, but it's going to play a quite major role in, yeah. Um, should it use it? Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, Ukraine will uh, play much more important role in coming uh, years and coming decades, but the, the question is what that role is going to be, whether it's going to be a productive role, if the EU, um, is, uh, is more involved with the Korean and make sure that newly emerged institutions are uh, are in harmony with the European institutions or whether Ukraine arriving to Europe absolutely unreformed, messy, and angry at Europeans who are not uh, standing behind it and helping out with the fight against corruption and, uh, and other, other issues. But I was recently in Odessa meeting uh, some ex English students of mine, <coughs> all who are under the age of 25, all of Europe were quite anti Semitic and also quite uh, homophobic, and that, you know, but also exceptionally pro European, which was to me an interesting battle to me. I was thinking, you know, how can those challenge, how can those attitudes be effectively challenged amongst the younger population without kind of, you know, being overly simple by kind of saying, you know, that's really wrong, we shouldn't think that, which is. You know, I struggle to challenge that with them because whenever I do, they just sort of laugh at me and say, oh, yes, they don't say it to me. It's so disgusting. People are gay. And I'm like, well, I'm half Jewish. They're like, oh, yeah, but you're different. So it's very difficult to challenge that. Um, obviously, there is a question of uh, um, lack of discussion and people debating. And then there is a history you know, when it comes to anti Semitism. And you know, it's a very complicated history through like, centuries. This country, and uh, I don't think that there is a there is kind of you know kind of aggressive uh, homophobia or anti-Semitism coming from the larger public. It's not there. Uh, the, 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 these uh, these issues are pop up usually in like uh, domestic conversations, and people use uh, language that is not appropriate without even knowing that you know, it's really bad. Um, so it's just lack of discussion, and it's it's going to be there. I guess it's going to be fixed. The other issue that I think is much more important in changing attitudes is not to make the same mistakes that many countries did in, for example, Central Europe, with uh, uh, emphasizing too much on uh, things like LGBT and using language that divides and separates different minorities from the issue of constitutional uh, access to constitutional rights. In the end, we have uh, countries that now actively rolling back all those equality measures they put in place during um, the European uh, uh, enlargement in the developments, just because they did it as a part of a trade-off with, uh, uh, with joining the EU, but it wasn't very communicated well to the public what it is that all about. It's not minority rights, it's not special rights, it's just an access of every citizen to basic constitutional <laughs> rights of being equal uh, as citizens. So I think that taking that approach in Ukraine right now is much more effective. And actually, we see some progress because um, you know, the community that fights for civil rights equality, equality in Ukraine is very small, as every community related to civil society sector. We're talking about thousands of people in a 42 million country. So the, it's very easy to, for ideas to travel um, between us. And like around one year ago, um, we started to push in, in a different narrative when it comes to uh, LGBT rights. We're starting uh, pushing narrative that at the moment is not about uh, going for specific legislation. 
or adopting specific laws. Make sure that every Ukrainian citizen has, for example, right for peaceful assembly or freedom of expression, and that is protected of violence that unfortunately is a part of reality. And this is something that no matter what kind of minority you're coming from, gay, straight, or Jew, you have absolute right to demand from the state. And it resonated surprisingly with the general public because of the past weeks we've seen with the Kyiv riot, and it's going to take place this Sunday. No matter what will happen, it has been already a huge success because we've seen so many support from the police, from Kyiv City Hall, from Vice Minister, then from regular public eager to join the fight just because they were outraged by fringe group promising violence and promising murders and attacks. And some people on social media say like, well, I don't understand LGBT issues, or I don't care about them, or maybe some are even against full equality, but then they're so outraged by this assault on basic freedoms that were fought so hard by everyone else during the Maidan revolution. So they're going to join Kyiv riot to make sure that the number of people is high enough and there is no chance of attack. So I think it's a very universal message. You can use it, and we should use it in every developing country. It doesn't mean that we're going to have to talk with people and educate them and try to bring more facts, not myths about those issues, but it's a longer road. I'm not expecting any progress happening in a year or two, even 10 years, but it's something different issue. We should start with basic things. What do you think needs to change for Ukraine to become a grown-up European-style liberal democracy? It's a very broad question. I think, you know, in modern world, especially, it doesn't matter whether it's a developing country or developed countries. Globalization has a very complicated effect on what is happening in every country. At the same time, globalization helps us to bring rapid progress and change, but then it also provokes, at the same time, things fall apart and, you know, go into rapid regress. And it's happening in the same country on the same day. So I think that our job is to try to mitigate those risks, but they're going to be there for some time, whether we want that or not. When it comes to democracy, I think that Ukraine is going through an absolutely unique moment when there is a general consensus among the public that we should establish new institutions that are going to be the base for future consolidated democracy. And it means that the society and, you know, one way or another, political oligarchy elites are still open for major trade-offs. And as we know from the history, trade-offs between elites and, you know, general public is what makes those dramatic changes towards democracy possible. And in the case of Ukraine, there is still a huge pushback from elites, especially from oligarchy elites. But at the same time, the creation, for example, of five anti-corruption bodies, and they're not functional, right? They don't work. They're not stopped yet. But at the same time, the whole thing of them being created is extremely important because once you create those institutions, it's very hard to get rid of them or roll back the creation. The other question, whether or not those institutions are going to be used by society in pursuing more rights and more political participation in the processes. Unfortunately, this question is very, is quite open. So, for example, I'm really all the time arguing that for better or worse, the only way how we can establish those institutions is with strong international support. 
uh, as a confidentiality of aid with the support, but also because the Ukraine is so good to join the European, uh, join the European family, that's why they're eager to, you know, to adopt those institutions without any, uh, without any reservations. So once we establish those institutions, how do we make sure that the society uses them in a, in a productive way? Because if you look at the polls, uh, unfortunate thing to see that when people are being asked all around the country, how much time did they spend in the last year participating in city hall meetings or you know, district meetings or just donating their time to go to their uh, uh, representatives from the parliament to you know, voice their concerns. Less than 5% say that they did so. So it means that the society in the public largely takes a back seat and they won't change, they are eager to suffer, but at the same time, when it comes to donating their own time and energy and making sure that those new creative institutions are in place and there is a profit control, it's not there and it's being um, outsourced to civil society groups. And it's terrific. I, I, I think that it brings lucky to have that there. So the civil society groups, NGOs, um, do anti-corruption control, then uh, they uh, make sure that the newly elected leaders are you know, uh, accountable and stuff like that. But it should be done by the public. It can be done by civil society groups forever because we will all die of exhaustion and you know, uh, everybody works 24 seven. It's not really something which can continue for long. But do you have faith in the administration? Because um, if it's a good I don't know whether what kind of opposition there is in Ukraine, whether it's sort of largely the pro-European side is one massive party, or whether it's fragmented. But do you have faith in sort of the current system, so to speak, to drive the necessary change towards Ukraine becoming what you could call a liberal democracy with an effective market economy? Or do you feel that there has to be further revolution within the kind of the new European order for Ukraine to become a functional member of Europe? I think that when we're talking about the changes within such a huge, diverse society, um, we should imply this uh, untraditional view of just a change going from the top to the bottom through specific state institutions, for example. So if we apply pressure to the government, to the parliament, suddenly we have a, a you know, positive change happening. In the case of Ukraine, or in, especially as you know, Ukraine as the country as big as it is, uh, it's more important to change our uh, focus and change our lenses altogether by looking at the country and uh, developments inside as like multi-tiered structure. So if you want specific change to apply to specific areas, uh, you should do that by, uh, like for example, uh, there are issues with businesses, international businesses, and international multi uh, uh, multinational corporations investing in Ukraine. <coughs> so when uh, investors go to Ukraine, mm -hmm. what kind of change they can bring? They can bring the diffusion between its own corporate, corporate cultures and you know uh, high integrity doing business in Ukraine. That's going to be one building block for future consolidated democracy. It doesn't mean that they have to go through the government, through the parliament, and those changes from the top to the bottom. They, it's, it's absolutely enough for them to go to some province, you know, get in touch with the local government that's open to that kind of uh, transparent business, do business there, create and many environment. The same goes for civil society sector. Civil society sector has so many like, issues. If you're, if we're talking about anti-corruption fight, you go to specific groups inside Ukraine who fight with, uh, within anti-corruption. And then apply pressure there and make sure that you know they're successful and so on and so on. So you have the so many levels and tires, you have to ensure that they're successful and uh, without just looking at it at broader picture of yeah. just let's make out of this country a liberal democracy. Yeah. That's not gonna work with Ukraine right. again because it's so diverse. And it, it it hasn't been the case with so many other developing countries in recent uh, 20 yeah. years. So you cannot just fix the economy and suddenly yeah. everything will be fine. Yeah. You cannot fix civil rights and suddenly everything yeah. will be fine. When you say diversity, are you referring to the linguistic divide or more urban versus rural? It's everything. You know, people speak uh, you know, a 
at least two languages, but many more. There are ethnic diversity of more than 85, I'm say, you know, 100 nationalities. Uh, economic diversity, regional diversity. So if you travel Ukraine from the west to the east, it's, it's extremely diverse, or even from the north to south. Uh, you can see so many different things happening inside the provinces. So it's not uh, uh, it's not homogeneous, you know, country. And I, I find it very fascinating. I think that's the strength of Ukraine in the future, just to be united in its diversity. Thank you.
supporting or living inside personality because of you know, big Muslim figures. And now you kind of diluted those smaller personality cults pop up time to time and disappear very quickly. So for example, if you look at the Ukraine before the Orange Revolution and after, it was all about personalities and people voting for personalities. But it kind of gets very unstable and uh, living a period of sh a shorter span of you know, those personality cults. It took like two years for President Putin to completely um, completely uh, losing his popular support after the, migrant, uh, the orange revolution. It took just six months for the Maori people to lose their popularity as the most popular members party for the parliamentary elections. So because people frustrated, because they vote for personalities, personalities don't deliver, then people get even more frustrated, and then they see <coughs> another person to the left, and that person obviously fails because the, uh, the expectations are running higher and higher and higher, but this kind of gets shorter and shorter, and it creates this very dangerous political instability. So in fact, if we try to you know, kind of promote policy with uh, politics with uh, for our citizens, it could bring some stability to the country, like it brought stability to Central Europe or Baltic states where they have this kind of private governance before the just to follow on, possibly no, a little bit. Just to follow on slightly from the Savchenko comment, I was wondering if what the state of the women's movement is in Ukraine at the minute, if there is one. Um, gender equality is such an exciting topic in Ukraine because Ukraine. One of the few positive legacies of Soviet Union is, <coughs> is gen gender equality. Because uh, after 80 years, um, Ukraine is a country where uh, women can run for office, not being you know like uh, discriminated based on their gender, get the same uh, salaries, basically run big companies, and you know women are quite powerful force and quite equal. Um, but at the same time, there is a, another tendency because of lack of education, because of things are not being uh, taught in schools or not being part of a public discussion. We have kind of a reemergence of sexism and you know discrimination based mm -hmm. on on, uh, on gender. Like for example, during the last parliamentary uh, campaign uh, uh, elections. Um, there, there were incidents when some parties would bring to the parliament uh, female MPs without any background. And, you know, it was mentioned or picked up by media. Well, then they say, like, you know, it's all business where suddenly after election we have MPs in the parliament who you know, nobody knows who they are and they have zero background in anything. But, you know, some people start suggesting that there's nepotism and they draw this, you know, as relatives or lovers or you know wives or whatever or husbands. But the problem is with the, that coverage that was very kind of widely shared and people would share on social media and you know, on TV and everything, that it was specifically based on their appearances as women. So nobody would say, for example, that uh, a man who's an MP, uh, he has no experience and everybody would attack him for experience, not because he a fancy suit or you know has a good haircut. But we in term in terms of those women who were specifically attacked based on their gender, that people would find their social media profiles where they're in bikini landing on the beach and saying like suggesting that this is a sign that she's not qualified because she has you know such kind of picture. And in fact like the Ukrainian Prime Minister can go like uh, with the naked chest on the beach doing pictures and nobody says anything. Uh, and I, I think it's, it's not a massive trend. Uh, still, the situation is much better than in many European countries. Even. But it's something that can get out of control very quickly if we um, if we do not you know, teach in schools. And it's not there. So there's no gender education. Saying like you know, genders are equal, and <laughs> nobody knows that women actually fought very hard to and to earn those rights and equality.
also the ongoing question of uh, NATO membership as well for Ukraine and you know, some other countries in similar positions as well as Russia. Um, I'm saying there's, a, there's been a, another push this week. I'm, I'm just wondering to what degree um, the, the push for NATO membership is um, just part of like, the, the natural process of Ukraine evolving into the community of nations in, in, in Europe. And uh, to, you know, to, 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 what, to what degree um, you know, it's really seen as, at this point as an extension of the diplomacy uh, surrounding the, the situation in eastern Ukraine. You are all probably quite aware of the Russian, of Russian propaganda narrative about the, the, about the story that somehow NATO's um, expansion or uh, increased activity in the region provoked Russia to uh, defend its interests and to invade Crimea, in Eastern, uh, in Eastern Ukraine, and be more aggressive in uh, defending its borders. Uh, is it true? That it's, that's absolute lies. In the way that, if you even look at um, uh, even look at just recent history in the 90s, if you look at funds that were allocated by NATO programs for cooperation in the region. Russia was the biggest user of those funds. Russia was the most stable, trustworthy NATO's partner in the region since 90s, uh, I mean, uh, until uh, early 2000s. Russia, I think it was like 85% uh, Russia would utilize NATO funds in cooperation. So in terms, when you talk about the NATO expansion and activity, it was mainly happening inside Russia. Russia used what use those money to um, uh, to benefit that cooperation. So it's just factually, historically not true that the expansion was happening just on the borders of Russia and uh, it was a plot to kind of uh, undermine Russia. Uh, the same kind of this narrative is very still popular when it comes to Ukraine and all the discussions that we have in Western media. Uh, one way or another being this kind of line, you know, that Russia thinks that NATO is, NATO's expansion is uh, not a part of their original deal. Uh, unfortunately, you know, because, I don't know, because lack of background knowledge or just because this issue is not being tested by journalists themselves, we're still kind of talking this discourse of NATO expansion and, why the, and why, what kind of instability it brings to the region. Um, I don't think that would be any interest, um, strong interest from the Ukrainian side, Georgian side, uh, towards NATO if, uh, if, if there's no threat <coughs> from Russia. And um, that's the only real kind of reason at the moment why the public wants to join NATO, just to be protected. Um, but in more peaceful years, um, people, the public want like to join NATO just to be part of the club, recognized as a some important player, and rejoining the European family could be uh, uh, for some uh, means to join NATO, although it's not universal public support. Um, so it's it's quite strong. But recent polls show about 36 percent of the, the population support the idea, which is quite strong. But still, it's not like the same as the European Union that is being supported by 80%, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, more. Yeah. I just wanted to ask on, on the press. Uh, is there a particular group <coughs> that supports the democratic changes in Ukraine, or is there freedom of the press? And uh, what, what was the implication that there is a name that being released to the journalists that want to be released to the front? Um, the question of uh, freedom, uh, press freedom in Ukraine is, uh, uh, is absolutely fundamental, obviously, for the process of consolidation of democracy. <coughs> at the same time, we cannot say, uh, looking at the unprecedented um, expansion of media freedoms in Ukraine in the, you know, in the last two years, something that has never been seen before. And then, for example, the existence of Romatsky is something that wouldn't be possible two years ago. And then the media that is 
credited by journalists as no ties to the states or to their business or any kind of business that's been inside the frame. Uh, it says a lot that you know the country is going through dramatic changes. But when we're digging deeper, we can see that we're enjoying quasi freedom when it comes to media by any frame. Because 95% of all media assets are owned by still by oligarchs. And uh, oligarchs treat those assets as a public project. They don't they, they don't treat them as businesses, or they don't treat them as um, as a as a respectable uh, journalism institutions. So it's not uh, it's not being philanthropic. It's just to treat journalism as a service for their own occasionally for their own interests. Uh, that's why journalists usually hugely underpaid in Ukraine. So um, if you view compared to Russia, where there is absolutely no other journalists left except like a couple of projects, still journalists, even at struggling independent uh, uh, newsrooms like uh, TV Rain or Medusa or Nova Gazeta, they get four, five, six times more than a journalist at you know, Ukrainian newsrooms, even oligarchs at home. Um, it creates kind of, you know, it creates very toxic atmosphere where if you're a journalist, it's very hard for you to survive by being just a, a good, honest, high integrity journalist. You have to earn your money and you're scared to lose your job. Um, and I think that unfortunately it's not something we can change often, uh, we can change overnight. As we look at other countries, uh, Moldova, Georgia, even Baltic states. We can see this problem almost in one way or another everywhere. And I think that the only um, kind of way to change it is unfortunately um, gradual, gradual change to talk to oligarchs and owners and try to reason with them that news businesses could be profitable <coughs> business models and not something they just like throw money in and it's constantly in the head and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't. They don't profit on those businesses. And then by changing this attitude, we can you know, start changing with the market. Unfortunately, it's the case. Uh, the other important uh, thing that can help is uh, the launch of public broadcaster. And this reform is stalled and blocked by the government for quite a while. Uh, the reform of first to national channel is not going very well. Uh, but there is such a great thing as Hamas, right? So it was created, designed as public broadcaster. It has all the structure of public broadcaster. So it was outsourced by civil society. They created a public broadcaster out of system that is working as public broadcaster. It's ready for the society just to use it. So we're open to the public. Everyone can participate and you know, influence the, 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 the company. And we are really looking much forward when the reform of public broadcaster is finished. We can just take this already working example and plant it there, and we don't have to create anything from scratch. But the other reason, which is important, whether or not the public will support us, whether the public is ready to the idea of just uh, having public broadcaster and own it as a society and demand some kind of service. Is it seen as a force of good progress or is it holding back Ukraine? Um, Ukraine is very religious compared to Western European countries. Do you think that um, it influences political decision or it uh, doesn't play any part? Um, uh, what do you think that Ukraine is religious and more religious than <laughs> Western European countries? Well, in some parts, there are churches that <coughs> in quite large numbers despite the economic difficulties, which is a sign of you know, going to church a lot. Well, Ukraine is, um, as we see experience from neighboring countries, uh, primarily from Georgia, 
where the church is is one just one church and it's extremely popular and has like ninety eight percent of public support which uh, not a single polit politician including Mikhail Saakashvili uh, ever had. Uh, in Ukraine you don't have that. There is no unit or in Russia for example where church is very strong and very aligned with the state and that influences the state policies a lot. You don't have that in Ukraine. In Ukraine you have at least like four powerful churches competing with each other and, and having their zones of influence. And it dramatically changes. Like for example, three years, four years ago, the Orthodox Church, uh, uh, Moscow Orthodox Church, was extremely popular, you know, taking half of the country, being you know, really powerful. <coughs> now suddenly there are uh, a number of uh, uh, church goers is dwindling and you know, they go back to other churches. Uh, when it comes to actual polling data or you know research, um, it's very um, kind of modern tendency in Ukraine, which is very progressive in the way that many people say quite a lot. People say that they're spiritual, but the number of people who actually uh, assign them to any kind of church is going down in the last 10 years, and it's it's not as you know high as it was before. So the majority of people at the moment they feel themselves as spiritual. They believe in God but they do not kind of associate themselves with a thing specific church, which is very kind of, uh, you know, um, a, a tendency that you can find it in many other developed countries. Uh, and I think partially is also maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a good researcher on this topic, maybe because of Soviet legacy, because people kind of regain their spirituality, but they are not a church goers uh, at the same time. Um, so that's why church is not as powerful in uh, in influencing policies, but at the same time, it still has much more uh, influence that it goes in conflict with constitution. So when uh, local communities or the government um, introduces, for example, mandatory religious classes at schools, something that goes against uh, the line. Or, for example, uh, uh, leaders, um, political public opinion leaders, use rhetoric like according to God or according to Bible or we should live by the Bible or it's against Christian, uh, Christian values and something like that. And they make it part, as part of their policies, especially in the government, because, you know, in the parliament they obviously can have in, uh, entitled to any use, political use they can have. But when you're a governmental person, your actual job is to make sure one of the you know, issues that the state separated from the church and church is not influence policies, that is not happening very often. And uh, like homophobia is something that all churches align very strongly. They, um, they are very successful at lobbying this issue. So uh, there's a, this a council of uh, religious organizations in Ukraine, uh, which is very effective in this issue. So they cannot agree on anything else. And when it comes to uh, civil rights quality for gay people, they align and you know very effective and as, a, as a one unified force. Uh, but again, Ukrainian constitution forbids uh, the union between church and the state in, in governing. That's something you know, that is possible to fight off if the society wants that. I don't know, it's up to you in society. You know, tomorrow they decide that they want Christian theocracy or whatever. But at the moment it's it's illegal, it's something you know, that people can take action against. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What, do you, what do you think the reasons are for options in Ukraine? <laughs> <laughs> well, how many of you are optimistic about Ukraine? I mean, like, <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, can, I, can I tell you why I'm optimistic? Sure, absolutely. I'm yes. optimistic because of people like you. Oh, um, you're a way too nice. The independent journalists who, in spite of everything, are telling, are, are trying to make things different. I'm optimistic that 
because of civil society, which over the last few years has made huge leaps forward in demanding transparency, uh, in uh, you know, demanding the rule of law, in holding politicians to account. And I'm optimistic because of the young new politicians who are going into Parliament, the students at universities who are starting to see the world and thinking and getting different perspectives. And it may take a generation, but I think all of those are reasons for optimism. Um, quite pretty much agree on everything. <laughs> um, well, uh, from a professional point of view, I kind of, this, um, this feeling of optimism or pessimism is kind of a bit redundant for me because it's just like, uh, because of the work that I've been doing for years as a journalist, I kind of uh, try to see uh, things non-emotionally and do not invest in them, you know, a lot of emotions. So it, for me, it's still quite uh, complicated to uh, assess the situation from the pessimism or optimism point of view. But at the same time, if I may, um, to share a bit of uh, personal kind of perspective and story. And, uh, you know, because I was constantly uh, not satisfied as many of my friends since I was you know, young and uh, um, I was frustrated with the lack of opportunity inside the country, and that is open the game and it was very hard to kind of grow up and then trying to kind of understand that you're a second class citizen and it's not going to change anytime soon. So it, it kind of led me to um, this constant uh, uh, pursuit of a better life somewhere else. And I left my hometown and then I left uh, Ukraine altogether and I traveled and I tried to find myself somewhere else. And it wasn't very kind of in the end, in the end of the day, I kind of understood that um, it's not working out, you're just like running all the time. And uh, when I came back to Ukraine, uh, and suddenly there's a revolution happened. And then since then, every day, almost every day, there are some things that upset me about Ukraine, but there are some things that surprise me in a very good way. And I kind of decided to give the country a second chance and stop running and try to, I don't know, contribute or help out, not in a way being activist or being involved um, in uh, state building, but in a way that me as a person giving a second chance and trying to help out and you know to uh, to make sure that, for example, the coverage is adequate, where there is a chance for uh, civil rights equality in the country. Um, because, exactly, because Ukraine uh, keeps surprising me in <coughs> positive ways. Uh, this year's Kiev Pride is a huge surprise for me. Uh, although the quality is far, far ahead, and maybe we will have a rollback next year, nobody knows. But this year, uh, <coughs> I'm encouraged by messages of support we have, and you know, people who reach out to, to us, allies, straight out allies, helping out. Um, <clears throat> some reforms that we don't talk about it very uh, usually, or even the public doesn't know, the procurement reform which with the start of an online system this August will make out of Ukraine the most transparent country in the world when it comes to uh, state tenders. Um, again, we don't know if it's going to last or will work, but it's a, it's a huge uh, success. Um, uh, fi fiscal decentralization that you know, left money, uh, tax money back in provinces, a revolutionary reform for Ukraine that many provinces would fight for two decades for having their own tax, earned tax money uh, staying at home. Many things. Um, again, young people in the parliament, that that's absolutely like a breath, uh, free for <coughs> um, So the, the question is whether collectively it's gonna be enough for um, lasting change, whether or not people support that change. And then the, that's the public's call. They have to be more involved in the, the processes. Yes? Um, on the subject of pride, um, how confident are you in the, I mean, when you were talking about the 
leasing them if it's quoting <laughs> Yes. How close? How confident are you in the Nats police in policing in, in effectively? So I remember, was it was it really long ago? It was a year ago when Yvonne and Mario came down and there were attacks and one guy got hospitalised and stuff, even though it was forced out of the city centre. Yeah. So, firstly, a do you think the police are are going to follow through on their public commitments? Because mm -hmm. we're used to. Demonstrative statements and the failure to follow them up. But also, which groups do you think are responsible? Are, are, which groups are making the threat specifically? I mean, apart from the traditional being sports, border, and stuff. Um, it, yeah, which are the elements? The exact reason why I'm uh, um, emphasize on the issue of protecting uh, equal civil rights and specifically LGBT so much not only because I have a personal interest in it, but because I see in this uh, problem uh, so many others um, taking, you know, taking roots or encapsulating this on one single issue. And it's very easy to communicate to others that this is illustration of what is everything what is wrong with justice system or lack of it, and what everything what is wrong with law enforcement bodies. Or you know, uh, horrible situation with uh, corruption and uh, inefficiency of those bodies. So in case of Kiev, right, for example, there is a very successful. Well, it's early to uh, deliver a final call, but at the moment everybody uh, is quite satisfied with the police reform. But just taking one example of Kiev, right. So this Sunday, people go um, in Kiev, right. There are going to be six thousand law enforcement. Uh, uh, people protecting, including policemen, uh, protecting the pride. Twice uh, the size uh, protection of the last key pride. Uh, just imagine that there are going to be violent attacks and they detain people. And they detain those people, what they do next? They cannot pro uh, prosecute them. They cannot you know, make sure that they uh, stand the trial. They have to hand over those people to law enforcement bodies and to courts, like even the police does not do the detainment of, you know, uh, uh, it's, the milice. it's Milice, who is also there doing their job by running, uh, running CISOs, I mean, like uh, detention centers and stuff like that. And then, you know, where problem starts, because you hand over those people and then Milice make sure that they, you know, go away uh, free, walk free. And then if they luckily or you know, miraculously go to court, then court delivers absolutely ridiculous uh, judgment, like the high-profile murder of LGBT activists in Kharkiv last year. And the murderer was arrested, uh, and he stand at trial. And in the end, he got 14 years minimum sentence with a uh, with a judge saying that gay panic was a mitigating factor. So just he's just like panic when he found out that the person is gay and he killed it. So it's a mitigating factor in a way that he was not, you know, in his right state of mind. It happened. So she said that you know, uh, minimum sentence is fine. Uh, with the attackers of last Kiev's pride, there were hundreds of them, at least like three, four hundred of them. Uh, just thirty were detained on the day of the attacks. Just three stand the trial and they were released on a, suspense, a suspended sentence by judge saying that she's really kind of felt the passion of their, um, that they're sorry, and then uh, their parents kind of, you know, intervened and you know, on behalf of them said that it's kind of not going to happen. So just, you know, kids were involved in organizing a terrorist attack on a peaceful demonstration, but you know they're sorry, so we should let them go. What happened? So it's a it's a larger problem. It's not it doesn't happen just with LGBT people. It happens with every Ukrainian citizen, and that citizen seeks justice. And if you're not powerful enough, you don't have money, you don't have connections. Basically, uh, people are not kind of feel that they can even uh, relate to this system to seek justice. So we have to fix it based on these examples were very illustrative, but if we fix the, this, it, the whole society will benefit. And uh, if I 
can simply comment on the French groups and neo-Nazi groups who are involved in this kind of violence. Again, Ukraine is not Saudi Arabia. It is not possible for you to be stoked by people on the street if you find out that you're gay. There is a very high level of homophobia in society, but at the same time, it's not aggressive homophobia. It's out of lack of educational knowledge. So when I was living in Russia, it would come up, and I was openly gay there too, it would come up in conversation about this issue, and then I say, well, let's discuss something based on facts, and I'm as openly gay, and I can tell you, for example, how it affects my life on a very basic level. And people would be like, in many cases, it would be very aggressive in a way that people would stop talking to you or just completely shut down, and a conversation would end. In Ukraine, it's absolutely, in many cases, there are unfortunate cases, but in many cases, people have this curiosity in response. They want to find out more. They want to debate with you. They want to find out details. Well, why do you think that you're so oppressed or whatever? I need actual details. Tell me more, which is terrific. They can use homophobic slur while doing that or just being inappropriate or whatever, but it's a very good sign that society wants to find out more. It's not just about closing this discussion. We're talking about violence. It's also another sign of lack of effectiveness from law enforcement bodies. Violence that we're talking about, fringe groups, is related to up to 10,000 people participating in those groups out of 42 million. And it's not about just violence against gay people, like Mukachevo incident, where those groups left unpunished for their attempts to get over smuggling business. The attack at the parliament, a very unfortunate, tragic attack that left three people, three soldiers dead, that wasn't very much condemned or investigated, although people stand at trial and got sentences, but it didn't send the right message. It keeps happening. Illegal raider attacks on businesses, undercover patriotism, stuff like that. So if you fix that, we're not going to be even sitting and talking about violence against the gay people in Ukraine. Sorry, but it's all right to just a quick follow-up. So the main issue is more in the inefficacy of the prosecutor's office and stuff, which is something this makes me think. You talk about the grenade attack outside the Rada and stuff, and then you have the same thing with the prosecutor's office making big announcements. So if you remember when Karpi Sector's base, was it in the Dnipro area, was surrounded and stuff, and they kept having these big standoffs, and the prosecutor's office was like, oh, we've identified the killer from the siege battalion who killed an SBU officer outside Wolf Park. But nothing ever came to this stuff, ever. We have huge announcements, but no one gets jailed or something. A politician might get harassed for a bit. They'll pick up someone from Ukraine, and they'll target them, but it always tails off. So it's the same reason. It's not so much an issue of particular attacks on groups. It's a failure for the police to ever... Well, no, they're not the police, but the law enforcement mechanism, the judiciary, to process this stuff properly. We talk too much, I mean, very often, that Ukraine, when it comes to reforms, Ukraine is such a complicated case, and there is so much stuff that needs to be fixed, and then nobody knows where to start. I truly believe that it's absolutely not true, although the to-do list is absolutely insanely long, but some things that can deliver change and prevent other change and provoke other change to happen lies within the reform of the justice system, but the first and major step is the reform of the general prosecutor's office. That's the only thing you have to fix to unlock the potential for other reforms, because so many things are there preventing of any change. Like, for example, this is the most important link that oligarchic elites have as the most important tool for them to influence politics and to 
be in power that's the only reason why they're because they have control over general prosecutor's office through you know presidential administration the second they lose it you know the suddenly there is no point of them being in politics because suddenly they cannot affect justice or you know be in control of this uh tube of uh running uh persecuting their um competitors or whatever or just setting the rules of the game so when that's why the system fights back so hard this reform everything it seems like everything possible in ukraine except the reform of general prosecutor's office um and because even like the president who's fighting the hardest against this reform too because he's a part of the old system and maybe i'm not sure i i'm not you know close person to him maybe he has like positive intentions to change the country um although there's less and less signs that it's the case but at the same time he with his old mindset he understands that the second he loses control of a general prosecutor office he's nobody because he cannot threaten uh to open cases against people he wants to you know prosecute and so on and so on so he used it as a, a must tool for him to stay in power and be powerful um so change that you know office it will unlock so many other stuff that could be potentially uh, effective persecutions of the people from previous regime that are not open anymore those cases are closed or you know on put on indefinite hold those people are back in the country the, their businesses are running they robbed you know the country to the point of you know absolutely insane kleptocracy but at the same time all their businesses up to two years after revolution are working very fine you know the Yanukovych's uh Ivan Yushchenko Ivan Yushchenko uh Kurchenko Ivan Kurchenko has a huge media empire never been investigated at uh, you know enterprise ever since like two years working keep you know producing content whatever Ivan Yushchenko like case closed effectively um you know it's just it's a total disgrace like, at least like deliver justice with something that we know you know for sure that happened um so that's the key reform if it's not happening you don't see it in coming like year two three there's no change of there is no possibility for any change anywhere in any sector i have two lead questions yeah. at the beginning you said that in the process of consolidating democracy building new institutions for reforms itself ukraine needs international help <laughs> not just monetary help but uh, pressure or conditions attached to that aid. Do you think there is enough of this pressure from international donors and are they consistent in what they ask from Ukraine? This is first question. And a second question, say Brexit happens, uh, United Kingdom leaves the European Union. Do you think it's going to impact of what's happening in Ukraine in terms of developing democratic institutions? Um, when you look at the recent news regarding uh, this very overextended program and a program excuse me, uh, regarding bailout, uh, it was put on hold. Then now it uh, is uh, up and running, but in uh, limited capacity. And but it's a, a good illustration that uh, Western policy towards uh, Ukrainian reforms has been weak. And not enough. Uh, for example, despite the absence of uh, reform in general prosecutor's office, despite that the parliament put, uh, voted for constitutional amendments um, that will lead to justice reform, judicial reform, but at the same time those uh, amendments are put on hold until 2019 with no guarantees that will be in vote after uh, that period. Despite all of that, suddenly IMF says like well you check some technical boxes and you can get your money again uh which sends a horrible message to those elites who are fighting against uh, uh reforms because they feel empowered and no matter what we do we'll get our money and then uh after the next day after appointment of new prosecutor general who is you know president portion who's crony has no even background, sufficient background as a professional to run this office, uh, the United States sends $1 billion of unconditional aid 
to the country hailing this as a progress it sends a horrible message to those people that they feel empowered that no matter what they do they can always leverage on war on Russia and then justify lack of reforms so conditionality is weak and it's supposed to be there and unfortunately it's not there and I think we underestimate the power of you know how strong and how willingly Ukraine is looking up to the West and to international support because they're so sick and tired of local elites mismanaging the country for 25 years it's no coincidence that for example the most effective or beloved reformists are mostly foreigners whether of Ukrainian origin like Mali or Esco or coming from different countries like from Georgia like Ekas Galatsev who did the police reform because they know that unfortunately we cannot trust local elites anymore and we need to bring outsiders and because of brain drain we don't have enough sufficient resources human resources to just educate people who have exceptional experience so I think it's it's always constantly underestimated because every conversation that I have with like foreign you know governments and diplomats and they are always cautious and saying we don't want to press too much because it will backfire as you know as we would be patronizingly coming and saying we need to fix this and this and this but you well I'm sorry I hate this analogy but you can be pregnant right so if you're already investing so much time energy political financial as you know international partners to Ukraine without not setting any strings attached what's the point of doing that it's just like throwing money in the fire without any strategy so either you're all the way in and make sure that if you send money you also send knowledge you also send people on the ground who can help make sure that change is happening or you just be honest and say like we don't care about you we don't want you in Europe so stay out and just like let's build a wall or whatever and you know keep it out of Europe but you know that's that's why I honestly think that the Western support is not enough although I cannot not acknowledge how many how many energy some people some foreigners put to help out Ukraine so some embassies on the ground diplomats who work tirelessly helping out the media community the LGBTI community making real change possible and with the question was I totally forgot about the airports and the leak despite that some Western media can say that it's because of one of the piece the change happened and the president condemned it and suddenly there is open investigation investigation in the Ministry of the Interior it wasn't the case because it was a result of really intense non-public pressure by Ukrainian journalists and then diplomatic corps going to presidential administration going to Ministry of the Interior for two weeks in a row pressing hard and then when it suddenly becomes an issue that even the president or Arsenia Lakhov cared about and lastly about Brexit again I'm not very I try to avoid to talk about the issues I'm not a part of and you know it's obviously a decision up to up to the British people to decide no I'm not talking about I understand that's why that's why I think that the only kind of fallout from this could be based on just data and I was interested in I'm looking at data research and prognosis from you know analysts it seems like economically speaking Britain Great Britain will suffer more from you know exiting European Union than European Union but at the same time I think there's going to be you know just political damage because it's really hard to imagine in Europe you know Europe without Great Britain it just culturally historically doesn't make any sense and we worked so hard after World War II to kind of unite the whole European family in just one way or another 
and suddenly not having Derek and I have a kid and it's going to be very odd and I think it's going to be hurtful and quite damaging for the whole concept of United Europe. And related to Ukraine, obviously it's not a very nice message to send to those still countries who want to return to the European family. Not only Ukraine, but Georgia, Moldova, eventually Belarus, and eventually Russia. You know, we'll, one way or another, as we see from Greece history, we'll come back and we'll play the role as a part of the European family. So, you know, I think it's going to be damaging for that. There's a whole sort of thing going on, much more so now, about institutions like NATO talking about Russian propaganda and talking about it as sort of part of, or warfare propaganda, as part of warfare. So there's that whole thing going on about the need to counter Russian propaganda because it's a desire of war effort. But then on the other side of things, there's people that I believe and I tend to agree with who think that basically what the Russians are doing with their propaganda is completely backfiring and just doesn't work. And um, it's actually sort of making them look like idiots half the time. And, and I'm wondering if you, if there is a sort of debate mm -hmm. about that that you're aware of in your view. What do you do, how, how should you do mm -hmm. the Russian propaganda? Should you ignore it? My, in recent months, my message that if you want to counter Russian propaganda, don't come to us as journalists, and please do not support or try to support us. Just because, just stay out of it. In a way that, as many independent journal, uh, news journals all around the region struggling with the financing and finding means to support themselves. Sometimes they are forced to accept uh, help from um, programs that they're designed to counter propaganda. In the worst case, case scenarios, those programs are part of defense budgets. Uh, it, it just torpedoes any, uh, you know, any uh, base for independent journalism in the whole region because it doesn't work that way. Propaganda does not work that way in a way that it's not convincing people. And the study show, study, multiple studies show, uh, show that propaganda, especially Russian propaganda, is just destroying the middle in the discussion. So it, it radicalizes both people on the, for example, pro-Russian side and pro-Ukrainian side, absolutely destroying the middle ground for discussion. And then it opens, it opens up for uh, you know the search of propaganda, extremely powerful to to manipulate both sides in a way that you know if either are all radical, it's very easy to provoke them or you know, to play them. Uh, so it's unfortunately it's not fixable in a way that you cannot fix it with contra propaganda. Mm -hmm. If you create contra propaganda, you just reinforce the same circle because you create contra propaganda that will look bad with those people who are you know, on the other side and it will destroy trust to you and you will say like, well, they also lie. Like, look at you know, this absolutely ridiculous piece of contra propaganda that misses out on points or you know, hides facts. And the same goes with you know, that side. That side will use it saying like, well, they lie, we lie in a way, everything is so complicated and gray, so there is no truth, there is no objectivity, there is nothing you can actually believe, so just be distrustful and you know, don't take sides, which works fine, you know, if you need to uh, stir up some political um, emotions. So the only way to uh, fix this situation is for more respons responsible side to stop producing this nasty thing, which they call counter propaganda, and instead investing our resources and time in independent journalism, uh, no matter what, in a way that when people will get tired of propaganda, and as history shows, people get tired of propaganda. It's not something you can live all your life. It's very you know emotionally uh, draining. They will come back. They will reach out to information in the middle and 
we must be sure that that information is there, open for them, available of good quality, something that they can, you know, as consumers enjoy and, you know, be of a service. That's why, for example, we never, when we launched English, but more specifically Russian language news, we specifically set out, you know, public statements saying that we want to target and to speak to Russian language, Russian language people, specifically people in Russia. We want to address them, but we don't care about counter-propaganda. We're not following topics set by Russian propaganda. We will not try to break myths or bust, you know, some idiotic lies that they're producing. It's not our concern. We want to just provide independent journalists to the society that lacks it. I mean, it's very hard to be an independent journalist and produce content in Russian language. And suddenly, last December, the majority of our traffic at Russian, at ru.humatsky.ua, suddenly the majority of traffic would start coming from Russia. It's still in proportion. It's not big. We're not competing with, like, First Channel or any other huge popular content providers. But it seems like people reaching out for information that they find, you know, not biased, relevant. You know, it's something that can help them to make up of their own minds. We got a lot of criticism from, you know, those who think that, you know, it's not a patriotic thing to do or that you shouldn't do that or you shouldn't cover those stories with the perspective of Russian people because, you know, don't spend money on that. But at the same time, it is effective. People come in for that information. And I truly believe that at some point they will start reaching out more and more. Like, for example, numbers from Current Time, the project that was launched by Radio Liberty, although they have, like, editorial problems with the objectivity, but still they try to be more objective than Radio Liberty towards covering Russia. It has insane amount of views in Russia, and people consume this product, and they do share it. If you go on their website, you know, sometimes they have, like, hundreds of thousands of views, which for an American-sponsored project in Russia is something unimaginable. Just people, like, feel like it's high-quality content. Yeah. I just want to talk about Russian language. We heard a bit here today earlier about the status of Russian language in Ukraine. I know it's quite contentious, but do you think that in the future Russian will have an official second language status? And is that a desirable thing, do you feel? I really hope the question of language will not be an issue at all for Ukraine. I'm very surprised, and, you know, it's even, like, something to be proud of that a country, you know, people use as many languages as possible to understand each other. It creates additional diversity. And as we know from studies, diversity is a backbone of competitive economy, you know, and a healthy political environment. I myself, I'm coming from Eastern Ukraine. I was born in Eastern Ukraine. My family would speak Russian. So I speak Russian. I know Ukrainian. You know, I don't have any issues with Ukrainian language. You know, I respectfully, I don't have any bias towards Ukrainian language. But as a Russian-speaking person, I know for sure that everyone in each Ukrainian person knows Russian. So if I speak to them in Russian, they will totally understand me. And if they speak to me in Ukrainian, I will totally understand that. And I think that by doing, if you, like, travel in Ukraine and you, or you meet Ukrainians in groups, it's such a, you know, regular thing to see that people talk to each other in two different languages without switching. And I think it's, you know, it's an incredible thing to see. It's a diversity. People respect each other, learn to respect each other, starting from being kids. When they finally learn that it's fine to talk two languages, it's something you should appreciate. But at the same time, you know, to know as much languages as possible is not a bad thing. You know, people in the 19th century would learn, like, six, seven languages by default. So I really hope it's not going to be an issue for this country. 
Unfortunately, it was abused during the Yom Kippur regime a lot. It created frictions inside the society where there weren't any before. But Maidan revolution was extremely powerful boost for people, those people who kind of regained their Ukrainian language identity, started using Ukrainian language much more. And those people who regained their Russian language identity started using Russian language more, especially to counter Russian propaganda. They would say, like, you know, Russian language speakers would be hunted down in the streets and, you know, being stoned and you cannot speak Russian language. And so many people started speaking Russian language just in protest, saying, like, being a Russian language speaking doesn't mean that I belong to Russia and it's my part of my integrity culture I can reclaim no matter what Putin says. And that's something that, you know, myself I find very powerful. So I'm a Russian language speaker, but it doesn't mean that I'm suddenly supportive of Putin. Putin does not own my heritage and, you know, my background. And I really do hope that it's not going to be an issue and we can support both Russian and Ukrainian language because still Russian language is an important part of Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian history. So, no, I don't think that there's supposed to be a second language. But, again, it's up to the Ukrainian people. If they suddenly decide that's the case they want to do, it's a different question. Thank you so much again for coming. Unfortunately, I have to run for another appointment. It was very dreadfully late. But thank you so much again for coming. It was such a nice pleasure to see all of you. But, again, your questions are extremely, you know, brings me additional hope that you can spend your time talking about issues, not countering myths or cliches. So thank you so much. Thank you.